Welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. Uh, this webinar is brought to you in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, uh, Food Drink Ireland, Skillnet and, and National Rural Network. This morning, we're delighted to be joined by uh, environment, environmentalist, broadcaster and author, Eina Nilauna. Eina, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Eina will be talking to us uh, as part of our uh, contribution to Heritage Week, uh, uh, on the, the topic of safeguarding wildlife, the campaign for re re responsible use of rodenticides, our crew. Uh, Aina, you're very welcome. Uh, it's a topic, I think, which is fairly close to your heart in terms of the work you do with, with crew. That's right. I'm the communications officer with crew, so I'm meant to be communicating the crew <laughs> message. So it is this is one of my efforts to communicate the crew message to the audience that's listening here today. And I want to thank you and Catherine for inviting me to come along and give, give this um, podcast or broadcast or whatever, whatever webinar, isn't that what it's called indeed? Yeah. So anyway, so will I just get going then? Just yeah, my and, just, and just to say welcome to, to Catherine Keena. Uh, she'll be handling questions at the end. So yeah, if you want to share your, your presentation with us and just remind people that at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions and answers. So use the Q&A. Yeah, so then they'll, they'll put in the questions and then I'll answer them at the end. That's great. Okay, right. well, I'll try to share my screen and let's see if this works. Okay. Are we in business now? We are. Super. Great stuff. Okay, right. Well, I'm I'm here to tell you about um, the campaign for responsible rodenticide use. And rodenticides, of course, as we know, are what we would call rat poisons, or decides mean that they're they're killing things. So you have pesticides and you have insecticides and what have you. And then, of course, the rodents are the rats and mice, those sort of things. Now, if I can get this to move along, we're all in business. So, not going anywhere at the moment. There we go, yeah. Now, so rats and mice pose a threat to the health of humans and animals. So this is a fact. I mean, you know, people might say, oh, you love wildlife, surely you love all these things too. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that rats and mice are a threat to the health of humans and animals. And they're a commensal species of rodents, which means that, I mean, where did all these rats come from in the first instance? And for though, for though, for though, before we ever had farming 10,000 years ago, and people were hunter-gatherers, rats and mice were small little prairie creatures that lived in China, apparently, on the, on the steppes or the places there where grasses grew, and they minded their own business and they were a small member of, of the biodiversity there. But when we, as humans, started farming and started collecting food and keeping it for the wintertime and moving then, and populations grew when there was more food and populations moved, and we moved across the world, we're looking for places to farm. The rats and the mice followed us. <clears throat> and wherever you have people, you have mice and rats because they live commensally with us. So the, 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 the food we provide for ourselves, they are availing of that. Now, um, I'm just trying to work out how to, sorry, you have to bear with me for the moment. Uh, next, here we go. Right, yeah. So rats and mice cause serious economic loss. And... There's different ways by which this happens. So just to spell it out, I mean, they consume food, they contaminate food, they spoil food and feed. So even though they mightn't, they mightn't eat every morsel, by walking all over it, by urinating on it, droppings, all this kind of thing, huge contamination and spoilage of food through um, the, in, the invasions of mice and rats. They, they spread pathogens which are damaging to human and to animal health. They cause damage to buildings and equipment. They cause loss of poultry and game birds because they're all part of their of their diets and food if they can get hold of them. And of course, then there's damage to reputation, there's loss of quality and accreditations with board via eye gas. I mean, you're, you're growing your, your food, you have a credit, credit assurance. You certainly don't want to be having to be having rats and mice to contend with if that were the case. So. And there's no messing, really, when I say they really are a nuisance because the total crop losses caused by rodents every year would feed 200 million people, equivalent to almost 40 percent of the population of the EU. And that's at the moment. That's like when you consider all the work that we are doing to keep rats at bay. Nonetheless, there's still total crop losses all over the place because of the rats being there. They, they carry a range of parasites and pathogens, and these are wild disease, salmonellosis, brucellosis diseases of the hantavirus, 
various things like that. I mean, you know, that's urine and mice droppings in urine are, are, are full of all kinds of parasites and pathogens that we don't want. And because they're rodents, their teeth grow all the time. I mean, they just continue to grow continually through their lives. That's one of the definitions of a rodent. And they have to gnaw all the time to make sure that they don't grow through their lips. And so um, they're always gnawing through things, doors, wood, and through electrical wiring and causing fire farms as well. They reckon 25% of the fire farms <coughs> are caused by rodents gnawing through electrical wiring. So, so they're bad articles. We certainly don't want really want to have them. Anyway, I don't know. How, why can't I make this thing work? There we go. So um, as a consequence, um, what's the story on this? Well, no, there is, they are actually part of a food chain. So they have natural predators. And one of the typical natural predators that we know that it comes out at night and feeds on mice and rats are the barn owls. And they reckon a pair of barn owls feeding a nest of young will catch 500 rats in a season, in a feeding season. So that's very efficient if you can have a pair of breeding barn owls on your on your land you're going to be delighted with that the other owl that we have in ireland is the long-eared owl long-eared owl is actually more common than the barn owl it lives in woodlands and it also feeds its young on on rats and mice that's one of the main diets of these two nocturnal birds of prey and of course rats and mice tend to come out more at night when there's less people about and these birds are magnificent at catching them they can actually hear them don't see them so much, but those big rowdy yolks on their faces are like satellite dishes, and they can hear the noise the mice and the rats make. And then they have feathers right down to their, their toes. Most birds don't have feathers on their legs; they've scaly legs. But the but the owls do, and they silently swoop down, and the mouse or the rat doesn't know what hit it. Foxes are out at night as well too, and while foxes are omnivores and eat lots of things, mice and rats are part of their diet as well. And indeed, there are lots of, of carnivores that will add these um, mice and rats to their diet. And um, if all fruit fails, we have our Jack Russell as well. This is the huge, I got this out of one of the one of the Daily Mails or Daily Stars or something like this. It said the huge rat caught, caught by a Jack Russell is pretty large, all right. Mind you, rats can go, right, they, they have a two-year lifespan. It's just not, not that long, but they can go absolutely enormous. In the length of your arm, nearly from your wrist to your elbow, so it, they can be quite large, in fact. So that's a, a humdinger of a one that that rat has got. But you can't, in a way, I suppose, depend on whatever biodiversity, whatever wildlife it's, 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 that's around, particularly as we know in these times, the amount of biodiversity we have in our country is, is less than it was 50 years ago. So there has to be a plan, there has to be a, a controlling plan for these, and this is what. We're talking about when we refer to an integrated pest management plan. So this is a particular approach to getting rid of uh, mice and rats. And let's let's look and see what's involved in this integrated pest management plan. Mind you, mice and rats aren't the only pests. There are other pests too. But I, for the purposes of my talk today, I'm just talking about mice and rats. So definitions, of course. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization says that um, integrated pest management means the careful consideration of all available pest control techniques and then the integration of appropriate measures that discourage the development of pest populations and keep pesticides and other interventions to levels that are economically justified and reduce or minimize risks to health and the environment. So, on the one hand, you have to discourage the pests, but on the other hand, you have to do it in a way that's economically justified and that doesn't cause risks to human health or to the environment. Because pesticides do impact on the environment. And when I say pesticides, I'm talking about a pest is anything. A pest could be an insect, a pest could be a pigeon, a pest could be a rat. So pesticides is the general term for poisons that are going to kill any of these. So pesticides then, contaminate soil, water, turf, other vegetation. And pesticides also include um, weed killers as well, plant, planticides, plant killers, if you like. So in addition to killing mammals, insects, fungal diseases and weeds, pesticides can be toxic to a whole host of other organisms, including birds, fish, beneficial insects, non-target plants, non-target animals. All of these things can be contaminated by indiscriminate use of pesticides. And 
as we know, pollinators in certain parts have suffered a marked decline because these pesticides, they kill insects, aren't just focused on aphids and nothing else. They will, in some cases, you know, be, be um, toxic to pollinators as well, which are bees, certain flies, butterflies, moths. These are all creatures that visit flowers looking for nectar. Some of them, like the bees, looking for pollen and carry out pollination as a consequence. If they're all poisoned by pesticides that were never intended for them, this is having an ongoing effect. So we must be careful and use pesticides legally and responsibly. And this is why we're having this integrated pest management thing in the first place. So they have this, this, this risk hierarchy, if you like, with an increasing risk to the environment and the people that are involved. So what, what um, the thing is, you know, there's, there's a scheme whereby you, you just go through this, this, this risk hierarchy. You know, what do animals need? They need food and water. So, I mean, if they, if they get rid of the food, well, that, that deters them to go somewhere else to look for it. They make the site unattractive by removing harborage, places where they might hide food, water again. Then you stop them coming in. You make the buildings as rodent-proof as possible. You use mechanical trapping, which is not going to leave any kind of a footprint in the environment of poisons. And the use of rodenticides only when evidence of rodents is definitely seen and only until the infestation is cleared. So the very last thing you will actually do is use rodenticides, not the first. I'm just looking here at one of these um, one of these um, types of rodenticides that people use, a thing called storm, for example. And that's not the first thing we should reach for when we feel we might have rats on our, in our area. That should be the very last thing, not particularly storm, but, but any of these ones, because you can see, I don't know if you see my little arrow one up there, but this, this is the active ingredient here, a thing called flocumafen. Now, flocumafen is, is, is a really poisonous second generation anticoagulant poison. I'm going to come back to explain what that actually means, but it's something that you do not throw about lightly. So what are what are um, rodenticides? And the way they have invented for killing rats and mice is to produce an anticoagulant so that the, their blood doesn't coagulate and they bleed essentially to death inside and outside. And they, they invented those originally and a lot of us might have heard of something like warfarin. In fact, they, they use it on people now, to, to at least some a variation of it for people who suffer from blood clots and that to, uh, to actually reduce the amount of blood clotting. So these were the ones they had first. So they had warfarin, they had different other ones, these ones here that we were talking about. And they, 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 um, they weren't that toxic. They didn't last that long in tissues. So there was a lower risk of primary and secondary poisoning from those primary poisoning is poisoning the dog or the cat instead, and secondary poisoning is something eating the poisonous things. But on the other hand, because they weren't that toxic, larger quantities of them were required for longer periods to clear the infestation. And the real problem, the actual reason why we don't have them any longer is because things, rats and mice became resistant to. They actually mutated, they had genes in their system that meant they could eat lashes of warfarin, and it didn't have a a, 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 a bit of difference to it and they weren't dying as a consequence you were feeding the rats putting that out and putting warfarin into the into the environment for other things to eat so they invented they invented even worse ones which they call second generation anticoagulant now i don't mean worse i mean more more strong more effective and um they're, they're in two categories the, the words that well there's, there's five of them actually there as you can see you need a, an elocution lesson to learn how to pronounce them all but difficult and look look this one here, Locumafen, that was the one I was telling you about that was in the storm. They're the most widely used in Ireland. And then there are three other ones as well, Bromodialon, Dipodialon and Dipodialon. And these are all um, ingredients in the various types of rodenticides that we can buy. They're acutely toxic, they have chronic effects, and they have a long biological half-life. In other words, the, the, the time and half of them have gone out, if the carcass have gone out or something, is a very long time. and these are the ones that are in the in the rodenticides that are on sale nowadays, in fact. So we've gone away from the first generation anticoagulants because um, of becoming of becoming um, immune to them or becoming resistant to them. But the trouble is it isn't just it isn't just um, the ones that we want to affect getting it. We put it out for the mice and the rats, 
and the rats and the mice then are eaten by wildlife in turn. So as I said, they're part of the food chain. So we have wildlife species affected by this sort of thing. If they eat a rat that's poisoned, the poison goes into their bodies. So things that feed on um, rats, I, I explained about the barn owls, but there's obviously much more birds of prey than that. Red kites, kestrels, buzzards, peregrine falcons, sparrowhawks, these birds of prey have all um, been affected by rodenticides and nobody ever puts out rodenticide for a sparrowhawk or for a buzzard. You put it out for the rats. But the department, or oh, sorry, the, the, um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service and Birdwatch Island and the Golden Eagle Trust, all of these have done studies on carcasses that have turned up and um, detected that there is lethal exposure and not so not lethal not sublethal exposure to rodenticides in carcasses that are found dead. So what happens is that um anybody that comes across a dead owl or something, they may be killed on the road, they may have crashed into wires or something like that. So um they're all they're all um required by these agencies that I mentioned for analysis. And wildlife samples result of deaths from road traffic collisions, other accidents, and indeed from shooting as well. And they're they're sent then to a residue analysis to 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 um a lot of them is sent to uh, backwest and in fact in Dublin and in places in Britain as well. And as time goes on, the analytic methods change and things that weren't able to be detected on the previous time can be detected now. So we're finding out more and more about what is in these birds of prey that are found dead. And then, so then they have a particular monitoring scheme called Raptor, the, the Forest and Wildlife Service produce a report called the Raptor Report every year, say how much of these um, poisons have been found in the, in the birds of prey that they have been surveying over time. And um, they discovered, in fact, that there are, you know, lots of dead birds of prey who may have died because they hit a car, may have been shot, may have crashed into wires. But when they monitored, when they actually sampled them, they discovered that there was residues of poisons in them. So that didn't do them any good. I mean, why are they crashing into cars? How is it affecting their breeding? Putting rat poisons into birds of prey is certainly not the way we want to be doing it. So the Campaign for Responsible Rodenticide Juice was established to address this when Birdwatch Ireland produced the study a couple of years ago now, say that 80%, 80 percent of our owls had traces of rodenticides in them. That is an enormous amount of, of poisons in a bird that nobody puts poison out for. Everybody loves the barn owl and it's great and there's no enemies. And yet, because it comes out at night and it feeds mostly on mice and rats, this is what um we're finding 85%. This was similar to um the UK, but our carcasses actually contained higher residue levels compared to the UK. In other words, even though 85% of carcasses in both countries had them, our ones had had higher levels. Now, they, they didn't necessarily, they were sublethal. They didn't actually cause the death of the bird as such. But I mean, if every second rat you eat has, has rodenticides in it, because the rodenticides are not instant, you eat, you eat, um, a bait with 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 them um, fen or something in it, and you don't drop dead on the spot. So you go off, scurry off someplace. Presumably you can't you can't run as fast. You, and they're the ones that are going to be easier caught by the owls. In fact, and um, in Ireland we have higher residues because the our barn owls there's there's less little small things for them to eat. In in Ireland we don't have voles, we don't have field voles, we don't have water voles. The bank the bank voles are only in the southwest of the country. We don't have them spread throughout the country. So there are less little small mammals for owls to eat in Ireland than there are in Britain because fewer of them got here at the end of the Ice Age. We're an island off an island off the mainland of Europe. So we have fewer of these creatures. So there's more of a concentration in the owls on feeding on what we do have, which are the mice and the rats potentially. So, so there's concern that all of this incidence of residues is increasing. I mean, the UK have figures in the same way telling them that. But in the southwest of the country, where there are bank bowls, they're, 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 the contamination of rodenticides in the owls is less. And in fact, there are more, um, that's the densest part of Ireland where the barn owls occur. 
some other parts of the country, barn owls have greatly decreased. And I think there's something something horrendous, like about five, oh, I think it's what, 12 pairs of barn owls in the whole of Northern Ireland. There was great excitement when they found another nest in pair, and then they had 12 pairs in the whole of six counties. So as you go down towards the south and the west, we have more of them, and the bag folds are in that part of the country as well. I mean, if you want to look at the bag fold, if you want to look at the, the dinner of the barn owl, these are all the things that they will have in the in in the southwest in Cork and Kerry, they can dine in all these things. So they'll have their brown rat, the bank bowl, the wood mouse, the house mouse, and of course now we have shrews as well. The pygmy shrew is our native shrew, tiny little fellow, and the grey tooth, the, the great or white tooth shrew, has come into this country as well. It turned up in Tipperary apparently in in about two thousand and nine, and they reckon that it came over in the roots of fully grown trees that somebody with a big swanky house was planting. They couldn't plant saplings like anybody else. They had to import a great big tree to have instant trees. And the greater white tooth to true was in the root ball. And the greater white tooth to true doesn't even occur in Britain. This this came in from the continent, in fact. So it, it is actually pushing out the pygmy shrew. But as far as the barn owl is concerned, it gobbles the whole lot of them itself. In fact, there's a bigger mouthful on a great tooth to true than there is on the pygmy shrew. So this is this is all the diet that they have. But the only ones that are um, giving grief to us as farmers, to people who produce food, are the brown rat and the house mouse. The rest of these are non-target species. And then, of course, if the, if the, if the barn owl can nab hold of a any birds or bats or frogs, it will do that. But they're very few and far between the remains of those that we find in barn owls. But for the sake of completeness, just to let you know that the barn owl can feed on all of those things. And of course, barn owls are not the only top predator that these were denticides have been found in. We find them in things like kestrels. Kestrels are the ones that you see hovering on the sides of motorways, perhaps. And they, again, feed on mice and rats. They you wonder how they see them, but apparently what they see are the droppings, not so much droppings as the urine. Mice apparently piddle all the time as they run around the place. And it, the, the, the ultraviolet reflection of this is what the is what the mice is what is obvious to the kestrel. So kestrels will feed on those. These are kites. Kites are birds of prey that we reintroduced back into Ireland maybe 20 years ago. We used to have them up to the middle of the 1600s and they were persecuted to extinction. And they have been reintroduced in Wicklow and Wexford and in County Down and indeed in North County Dublin. The North County Dublin crowd haven't done very well because of the amount of rodenticides that they ingest through eating rats. And they're not successfully breeding as a consequence, though, fertility, egg laying, that kind of thing. This is the buzzard. And the buzzard has come back because we got rid of strychnine. Strychnine was a terrible poison that was around up to the 1960s, 70s. And when that was completely banned, Buzzards spread back naturally, and they're probably the most common bird of prey now. It's an absolutely huge one. And again, buzzards will feed on dead things. It will feed on mice and rats. It will feed on smaller birds if it can get it. But mostly, it's mostly small mammals, in fact, and um, residues from rodenticides have been detected in those. Aren't they lovely? They're, they're um, the, the owls of the owlets of the of the um, long year owl. They only have the long ears apparently when they're in the breeding season. They put up their long ears and the short ears at all. They're just swanky feathers, and they, they they fall in love with each other when their feathers are up. But these are only babies. They're not into that line of business at all. But they're getting fed. They're getting fed at night by their pet. They're, they're terrible. Squeaky, it sounded like a squeaky gate. And even though they have all their feathers and everything, they all sit in a row on the branch squeaking, give us more food, we're not looking for it ourselves. So poor mammy and daddy are killed, run ragged running around collecting mice and rats for them to eat. So if you're feeding mice and rats to, to, to small creatures like this, and many of them contain rodenticide, it's not any wonder that there is so much of that. And then, of course, we have mammals too that feed on them. I'm just showing you the stoat here. This one is the stoat, um, Banny Newis. So that's a daisy. So stoats, in fact, are quite small. But um, they, they will take on rats and mice and indeed rabbits and lots of other things as well. So University of Bristol did a study on, on stoats and they found that um, rodenticides were, were substantial on the game estates. Now, obviously, rearing um, peasants and stuff for game happens in, in, in Ireland as well, not as much as in Britain. But um, stoats in those areas feed on the grain and stuff that's left out for the peasants and as a consequence to get contaminated 
and um, they feed on 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 um, on the pheasant, young pheasants as well, so that that um, as a consequence, the, the um, rats and mice that feed on those things too, on the, on the eggs of your pheasants, the, the poisons are put out for them, and the stoats. So the poisons aren't put out for those particularly, but stoats are contaminated with all of these ones. So the main route of contamination is thought to be non-target rodents and rodenticide juice at the reared and fence and the feeders. The pine marten is another one now. The pine marten. The pine marten used to be the, rare, it, it, the rarest mammal in Ireland, and when our woodlands were very small and young and that sort of thing, we had very, very few pine martens. But the population of pine martens is, is recovering now after significant declines. It's a native species on Cotclan. It's protected under the Wildlife Act, and it, it inhabits forests. But it's, it's, it's an opportunist in a way. I mean, it can, it, can, it, can, it can feed on berries, fruits, small mammals, invertebrates, birds. It'll feed on targets and non-targets, and indeed, like the fox, it can sneak into hen houses too and and kill hens. And these 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 mammals, I mean, foxes, pine martens, the woodland, but they're woodland mammals. So I mean, if you're a woodland mammal, for doe, for doe, where are you going to get your birds? They're going to be roosting birds. So you go into a flock of roosting birds, you start killing the the birds. All wake up and fly away. You're lucky to get one or two because they they can escape. So there's a great flurry. You're all excited. You kill that till they're gone. Into a hen house, that doesn't happen. There's a roof on the hen house. The hens don't fly away. So as a consequence, they, they can carry it off in a frenzy and kill everything in sight because that's their nature. So in a way, <laughs> take the roof off the hen house. But I'm I'm saying that facetiously because what you really want to do is make sure, if you can at all, that your that your barns and places where you keep your hens are absolutely proof. Keep out pine martens. Keep out foxes because foxes are considered to be vermin. And um, you, you can get rid of those, but you're not allowed to do such things to pine martens because they're they're protected. So we have other food chains then. So that's all fair enough. These are all mammals feeding on rats who feed on 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 on, on um, poison. But there are other birds of prey that never go near a rat or a mouse. This is a peregrine falcon. This is a sparrow hawk. These are both birds of prey that feed only on birds. So there's they catch them in the air and you see, I'm always getting pictures of sparrow hawks with pigeons and people saying, what's this bird of prey in my garden? The female bird of prey, the female sparrow hawk is huge, much bigger than the male and can take down a pigeon. But we are discovering that they, in fact, have rodenticides in them as well. Now, how would you get that? And the thing is, of course, because the food chain that they're at the top of is snails being eaten by thrushes, being eaten by birds of prey. So as a consequence, if you have that poisons or any kind of rodenticides in snails, it's going to work up through the system because it doesn't break down. So how are you going to get it into your snails? And this is where you have your bait boxes left out for a very long time and they're not proof for snails and slugs and things like this. So they can get in, feed on those and send it up through the food chain that way. And the science is telling us that these birds of prey that never looked at a mouse or a rat in their lives also have um, contamination of rodenticides in their bloodstreams. And then, of course, we are talking about non-targets. We don't want to be putting out poisons for pygmy shrews or for great-toothed shrews. This is a field mouse that lives outdoors. This is a bank bowl. And yet, these come into bait boxes and feed on, on the bait that's poisoned and gets into them. And they are never a target species at all. So. Rodenticides can so easily escape into the environment, go into the food chains, go into species it was never intended for. It's 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 a lethal thing, and it's something that has to be treated, and um, you know, very costly. So caused by permanent bait filled boxes being entered by non-target species. So the field mouse or the bank bowl goes in to eat whatever's in there and gets it. And then the th the third um, problem, if you like, is this idea of resistance. Now, I spoke of resistance by the mice to the warfarin, the first generation anticoagulants. So you're putting that out, it's not working. And first generation anticoagulants, that's what Edgars mean. So they also discovered that the rats equally have resistance confirmed to warfarin, these other ones, these other ingredients that I'm not even going to try and pronounce. And as a consequence, first generation anticoagulants are absolutely not in use any longer. We're all on to the second generation ones. And now 
horror of horrors, we have discovered that there is resistance in rats to Bromadi alone and to Dyphenicum in Great Britain, in the south of in the along the south coast of Britain, from the middle over to London, all that area there. The, the, the pest controllers are told not to use Bromadiolon or Diphenicum in their um, rodenticides when they put them out, because all you're doing is feeding the rats and making even more and more of them immune to it. So you have a, a, rat, a rat poison that doesn't work. So the, the widespread distribution of low level, non lethal residues of anticoagulants in wildlife is the main reason why crew was set up in the first place. And this Crew Ireland, as we have crew was set up in Britain originally, then we have crew Ireland set up in 2013. And now we have separated from the association in Britain. They have Brexited themselves. They're under, I mean, Britain is not under EU legislation any longer. So we operate ourselves. So we are also currently funding research in resistance in rats in Ireland. So apart from studies showing that it's resistant in Britain. We are doing studies now on these crews funding this to see if they're resistant in rats in Ireland. And the results of that will be in shortly. So the aim of the campaign for responsible rodenticide use is to pro protect wildlife while promoting and providing effective rodent control to the responsible use of rodenticides in rural, semi-urban and urban settings. So it's not just in rural areas, it's not just in farms, it's everywhere. We want effective rodent control through the responsible use of rodenticides. And as a result, then, we have um, who is CRU? CRU is actually, it, it involves um, the eight companies in who produce rodenticides in Ireland. So if we buy any rodenticides in Ireland, they will be made by um, at one of these eight, one of these eight uh, companies that make them. Now, some of these have obviously operations in other parts of the world besides Ireland, but they, they all operate in Ireland. So they're all Irish identified product authorization holders. They're major manufacturers or distributors of rodenticides. So they are making the rat poisons under strict license, investigated, given licenses by the by by the department so that their, their products pass um, standards. And it is in their interest that they can continue to sell these. So they have all joined up and joined our crew, one crew, in order to make sure that we're all on board. So who, who have we got then? So the, the, the board of crew consists of those eight companies represented from those and our chairman, who is at the moment Dermot, Dermot Sheridan, who's been our chairman for the last while. Our first chairman was, was Mark Lynch and he did absolutely Trojan work in setting it up and getting it all going. And on his death, then Dermot Sheridan has taken over. For my sins, I'm the communications officer. But as well as that, then, so they're the board, they're the people who make the decisions, they're the people who have the money and carry out um, all of the, the, the publicity funding and the research on, on resistance, that sort of thing. Then we have stakeholders then who are interested groups and these are all part of the, 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 the board, not the board, the stakeholder group that meets once or twice a year. Chagask is a member of the stakeholders, as are lots and lots of organizations, local authorities, HEA, um, different, different groups are, who are all stakeholders, there are about 40 stakeholders. And then we have supporters club. Then these are people who use rodenticides responsibly and they're in accordance with the crew club. They, they have joined the supporters club and are able to use symbols like this on their on their vans and things like that if they wish. So these this is who crew consists of, in fact. And then we have the we have the crew code. Then the crew code has four do's and three don'ts. So always have a planned approach to what you're going to do with rodents. Record the quantity of bait used and where it's placed, use enough baiting points so that it does the job, collect and dispose of rodent bodies. So you must always do that. And you must never do the other things, which is leave bait exposed to non-target animals and birds. You never fail to inspect the bait regularly and you never leave bait down at the end of the treatment. So this has been um, the, the, the set and the crew code, if you like, the, the campaign for responsible rodenticide use. And since 2013, as um, more um, work has been done on authorising rodenticides to be used in Ireland and the instructions for those 
a part of the label of these of these um, poisons. The label is the legal requirement. The, the crew code has been incorporated into that label. So what was being said by crew 10 years ago is now actually part of the way we're all expect the way we're all obliged under the law to um, treat the rodents that we come across. So this is the legislation now as currently applies in Ireland in 2023. The label on the product is the legal document and product must be used in strict accordance with the label, as I said. And that includes the, the, the crew code, which I have just quickly outlined to you in the previous slide. Now, there are four categories of rodenticide users, according to the way um, the situation is in Ireland at present. And there are different rules that apply to each category. So let's see, who are the rodenticide users? So the first lot are the trained professional users. These would be professional people with bans, not want to mention any particular group, but the, the renter kills, the pest controls, the all these, these um, professional people who are trained professional users. They have a PMU number, which is the professional number. They're registered with the Department of Agriculture. They're trained to a recognised standard. They offer commercial pest control services. They must keep detailed records of everything they do. So they're, they're the ones that are top. Then we have trained professionals for own use only. And these have an own use number. They're trained to a recognised standard in rodent control only. The trained professional users are trained to a recognised standard for all kinds of pests. So insects, birds, any of those things, the trained professional users have a full plethora of, of training on those. The, the own use only people have one just for rodent control only. They have been trained to a recognised standard, a different standard to the trained professional users, but a standard nonetheless. They have to pass exams. They have to actually get their, their certificate. And then these would be people like facility management staff, gamekeepers, storekeepers. And these must, must keep detailed records. They can only use rodenticides for their own use in their own place where they work. They cannot do it for gain or they cannot do it for anybody else. That, that, that their certificate, their recognition only covers them for that. Then we have the professional users. So the other lot were the trained professional users. Now we have professional users, and this includes farmers. So professional users, users are permitted to use for denticides indoors and outdoors, around buildings, on their own holdings. So that's indoors and outdoors, not willy nilly and 45 acres all around the place, but indoors and outdoors. They can only do it for a maximum baiting period of 35 days. They have to keep detailed site records. They must use tamper-proof bait boxes. And the minimum package of rodenticides that they can use is 2.5 kilograms. That's the minimum size in that and bigger. And then they need their DAFM number, which is your herd number, your flock number. And the big thing is they cannot carry out permanent baiting. Permanent baiting is not allowed to be carried out by anybody but trained professional users on the previous category. And we'll come back to that now in a moment. Now, the general public, of course, are limited to using lower concentration products and in restricted pack sizes. So they can only have um, less than 30 milligrams per kilogram. So they're, they're, they're lower concentration and they, they can only be sold to people who have no PMU number or DAF number. So if you go into a place to buy, to buy, to buy rat killer, rat poisons and you don't have one of these numbers you can only get the general public use and again the product can only be used indoors and outdoors around buildings for 35 days and again you're not the public are not allowed to um do permanent baiting but um who's going to monitor that but the, the stuff they have is, is less concentrated than the ones that the, the agricultural people and the, the amused the other ones the other categories are allowed to buy so continuous use then of toxy bait is actually permanent baiting. It can only be undertaken by trained professionals who are registered and have a PMU number, that first category. They can only use products that contain these two poisons, by diphenacum and bromodialone, because they um, are, are what they are allowed to use, so that if there's a resistance develops in, that, in the rats to these, because you've left the thing out on a permanent basis, you have the other three ones that I've for flocumafen and other ones like that, they can be brought in then because the rats won't be immune to those. But if everything is used willy nilly for permanent baiting, well, then the resistance could arise in the whole against the whole lot of them. And what are we going to be able to use then? So there must be a risk assessment carried out first. 
limited to sites with high potential for reinvasion. In other words, if you live next door to a broken sewer, you live next door to a landfill site that isn't managed properly or something like that. You can only do it where other methods of control have proved insufficient. We visit the sites every four weeks and review the approach periodically. So permanent baiting is the last resort, not the first resort, and it really must be justified with a risk assessment first. So crew have produced various um, leaflets and information that's available for everybody they can have. We, we can download them, or indeed I have hard copies if people want me to post them out to you, I will. This is the farm one for the effective control of rodent pests on farms, which is specifically for, for, for people with farms. And this one here is our best practices requirement. This has been updated um, in 2020 to um, have the most recent regulations. And this, if you like, is the Bible. This is um, the best practice requirements for rodent control and safe use of identities. So the legal requirements for anybody and everybody is in that one. This one is the one that is specifically designed for farms. So we do have a biodiversity crisis in Ireland. Half of our wildlife numbers have been reduced since 1970s. The amount of creatures now that were there in the 1970s, half as many owls, half as many things like, and in fact, some of them are gone nearly completely, things like corn crakes, curlews, they're, they're practically gone altogether. But less insects, less everything else, a biodiversity crisis. So we don't need to be adding to it by carelessly and unnecessarily using odenticides. So this is why um, who is set up and this is why the regulations have changed so that this is the way it's to be done now, because our, our, um, the bottom line really is that the rodenticides that are used in Ireland have come through permissions from Brussels, from the EU, into Ireland, and then the department legislates them for Ireland. And if they're pulled because they're causing huge environmental damage, what will we have left to control rats and mice, which we do need to control in the first place? So responsibly using these really, really tools, these really, really, you know, vicious tools in a sense, are what we need to be doing. So trapping Jack Russell Terriers, lovely um, habitat for your barn owls, encouraging the top predators to be on your land and do the, do what they want without poisoning them. These are these are the way forward in a sense. And lots of people are doing this and in, you know, in some cases, I see people putting up barn owl boxes and encouraging barn owls to be on their land. And this is all part of an approach that is, you know, encouraging biodiversity in Ireland and, and, and leading to a more healthy environment all around. So thank you all very much for your attention. I shall stop sharing the screen now and you can stop applauding. Thank you very much, Aina. Uh entertaining and, and informative as, as, as always. Uh, we have a, a number of questions coming in and just to remind you, just to put in your, your, your uh, questions on the, the q and I suppose, Aina, a question, since you've started, do you feel that a crew is, is having an impact out there? Yes, well, it is having an impact in the sense, I suppose that, um, sorry, that what we're talking about is that, is that, um, what crew were saying for in Britain and now in Ireland has become part of the label, has become part of the legislation. And when farmers are, are um, under new schemes, um, it was GLOTS, now it's Acres, part of what they're doing in those schemes includes this responsible rodenticide use as well. It has actually got into the areas where we want to do as part of what has to be done, whether it's being done. It's another matter, but I mean the fact that it's actually recognised and in in the requirements for those schemes that certainly is a success, is it not? And responsible people are being made aware of these things. I mean, like anything else. I mean, long ago people thought, oh, we keep out the poisons to be sure, to be sure they won't come back. But the more we the more we learn about how rats behave and what they do, you know, leaving something out to be sure, to be sure. I mean, if you were a rat. Would you prefer to eat a big waxy block with poison in it? Or would you prefer to eat loads of grain that's spilled? Or if you're up in Dublin, would you not prefer to eat the pizzas that are near the dustbin rather than eating the wax poisons put out by Dublin City Council? So, you know, to, to educate people in the sense that poisons is the last resort because the rats will not eat poison in preference to eating lovely food and to eating things that they want to be eating. And that you have to remove all of that sort of food and harborage and places like that. You have to nearly, as it were, think like a rat. So to, to get all this into 
the requirements for these official things, we have to think is a success indeed. Yeah. And I suppose one of the messages we have a lot of advisors on with us, a lot of a lot of them involved in programs like like Acres, and just to constantly remind farmers that it is a really key part of of, I suppose, their contribution to wildlife. Absolutely, it is because, as we know, farmers are the custodians of the land. Farmers actually, you know, want to feed biodiversity and wildlife on their land. Indeed, they're not they're not wanting to get. Excuse me, they're not wanting to get rid of it as such. Obviously, they have to control their mice and rats. I mean, this is particularly grain farmers, or any kind of farmers, because they're all feeding animals if they're not growing grain or whatever. So it, it can be a problem anywhere. But it's just a different approach to it rather than going out gung ho and trying to wipe them out because we can't wipe them out. I mean, we've been trying to get rid of rats for the last 10,000 years since we carefully let them come with us. In fact, the only place in the world where there are no rats is Alberta in Canada. They actually, people got there only in the last century, in fact, in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, and they got there before the rats, and they patrolled the border. I went out there once to have a look, and they patrolled the border to keep the rats away. Well, mind you, they're backed up against the Rockies, and it's Canada yeah. and Montana on the two sides. But they, the only place in the world where there are no rats, because the rats are really very clever. So what you're trying to do is manage them rather than exterminate them, in a sense, and manage them to... Let them be wherever they like, but then eat and be on your eating your food and eat and contaminate your food. So it's it's poisoning them to heighten it up and managing them is the way forward in integrated pest management. And that's what through are advocating. And I think it's it's getting through it. The message is getting through at least. Okay. Question starting to come in there, Catherine. Yeah, lots of questions. Can I just make two points first, Pat? First, thanks to the Hirsch Council that because this is Hirsch, we Heritage Week, we have focused on this and Heritage Week is an initiative of the Heritage Council and just to encourage everybody to go to um, heritageweek.ie, it continues this weekend to find out uh, what events are in your own local area in your county and Heritage Week includes natural heritage, which we're covering today and built and cultural heritage. So that's just the first point. And secondly, then to add, you mentioned the, the acres and you mentioned owl boxes. So I have the figures. Um, there's over 10,000, in fact, 11,500 owl boxes going up, uh, gone up, should be gone up by the 31st of July. And those farmers must follow crew. Now, all farmers should follow crew. Um, but specifically, it would make no sense putting up a barn owl box and putting down rodenticide. So that's good news, isn't it? You know, and it means that for those 46,000 farmers will be attending a course before the end of the year, an acres, a day long course on, on the biodiversity and the acres measures. And crew will be mentioned, Dana. So, you know, that is so superb. It's, 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 it's all building up. I mean. As education goes on, people are becoming better informed. And, you know, the door is not completely yeah. closed. And so wildlife is not all gone. And we can, we can get. You know, can. And Anna, to make, to help your life, I mean, I will be making sure that the, um our booklet that we've, we've done will be going out on all the, the Chagas courses. But again, we've, we've private advisors listening in here. So if they want supplies of that booklet to go out, on on their um acres courses it could, it's just an opportune time to mention that now pat i'll get to the questions now there's a couple of hard ones here um the uh Anna, you mentioned and if you can keep them brief because we're we, ha we have a lot coming in we you mentioned the effect of rodenticides on the species at the bottom of the food chain just as, such as snails is there any concerns with pesticides such as slug pellets Oh, yeah, of course there is. I mean, the slug pellets go into the slugs and the slugs are eaten by thrushes and thrushes are becoming much less common because of the fact that they're they're full of blue blue tablets or whatever it is they give the slugs. So, I mean, I'm just talking about the owls because that yeah. was what I was talking about. That the same principles. One. The food chain begins with rats. and the, But the, the other food chains are equally contaminated and we shouldn't be putting out slug pellets or slugs. People who are gardening, growing flowers, not eat the flowers. You know, I mean... If your whole crop has been destroyed, that's one thing. I mean, if the slugs are eating all your hostas, grow something else. You know, I mean, don't you don't have to live or die by having things in your garden eaten by slugs. But putting out the blue pellets is the same thing. It's poisoning the environment. Very same principle. Yeah. OK. Another one. Although the active ingredient zinc phosphide is not cleared in Ireland, has any research been carried out in relation to secondary poison poisoning in non-target species with uh, zinc phosphide where it is permitted? 
Have you ever heard of zinc phosphate? I have, well, I haven't heard of any research mm-hmm. being carried out. But again, it's something like zinc is put into the bottom of that. It doesn't break down. It's going to build up as well. I mean, the, the monitoring systems that the Raptor is working on are SCARs. Would, you know, presumably you need different chemicals tests for other things. I mean, funding, please, and we'll do it. Yeah. Again, lovely compliments coming in for you, and I won't read those out. Um, is there a risk assessment document for farmers? That's a good one for us, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you're you know, doing this, I mean, in order to to actually put out rodenticides and get into that scheme, there's a whole bit. I mean, crew have produced all of these documents. Yeah. And um, certainly for the for the the PMUs for the the people that we train in this. Um, they, they go through this whole business of, of risk assessment and um, the farming, we, the farmers don't get a crew training from crew as such, but the documentation is, is there. there. And yeah. The farm, yeah. There's pages that you fill out, what you do, where you put the bait, the map at the farm, the whole lot is there. And then when the inspections happen on the farms and bait is seen to be being used, the, the, the inspection inspector comes along and says, well, where's your documentation? And all that, all that empty information, mm-hmm. all those pages are available to be had. And if you're using putting out dates, you have to you have to do all that risk assessment. Yeah, that that's all part of it now. So we direct them to, to crew.ie, and I presume. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So there is a good, a very good website there. Start if not, if any problems come back to us. Uh, how often are the guidelines reviewed? I'm not sure which specific guidelines now, but it's coming from the department. I mean, it's it's and every time the license for these these um, active ingredients come in. So um, Storm or, I don't know, some of BASF or some of those people who want to produce their, their poisons again, they have to get approval for these things to be used. And I think a license only lasts three or four years. They're always being renewed every five years and the regulations coming in from Europe might be tighter this time than they were the last time. So it's always a relief to the companies when they get through the gap and they can sell their products. So I think it's every five years they are they are reviewed and getting tighter rather than looser as well. Okay. Do you think there should be a return to the use of the Jack Russell to aid road and control? And Anna, can I mention, I don't think you mentioned them in your presentation. Can I add the cats there? So Ooh, comment on dogs and cats uh, as useful rodent control. Absolutely. I mean, they're the ideal thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know wildlife will do it, but I mean, a, a good Jack Russell is the business. And, you know, it depends on, on having farm animals, cats, I mean, big fat pussy cat sitting inside it only drinks cat milk and things in pouches. They want outside cats who are going to be, you know, and cats really can do a better job in some yep. cases than dogs. So it can be too lazy sometimes. But certain breeds of dogs are really good. And the more you can get it done naturally by one species, a predator feeding on the prey, this is the least impact on the environment. And you mightn't be able to nail down a few barn owls to live in your garden, but you can certainly go out and buy yourself a cat or a dog and hopefully that will keep them at bay as well. Because yes, you so. want you want to get rid of them from where you are. You don't want to make them maybe extinct, but you don't want the rats and mice where the cat and mice, cat and dog is. So that would be the ideal solution indeed, yeah. Yeah, and perhaps this is the, the opportune time to say that when the board be a, a um, inspector, inspector comes to farmers and there is a question there about the rodenticide plant, because obviously we don't want uh, rodenticides around food. But just to reassure everybody that the, a, a plan does not mean rodenticide and the plan can be, you know, uh, the, the the crew plan uh, and it can also be the cat or the dog. You do not have to use rodenticide. Be mechanical trapping. There are lots of kinds of traps. Yeah. Now. Somebody was telling me there with the, that they have traps I know it probably costs a bit, but the traps, the trouble with traps is you catch something in a trap and then is it killed or is it only caught by the leg or the tail? And, you know, you have to have humane, a humane situation. But some of these traps now can talk to your mobile phone. There's apps for them. And if it goes off, the thing that goes off on your phone and you run out and see what's caught in it. So, like, I mean, if you really want to and go down that route, trapping can work exceedingly well. OK, I've just three more and then I'll go back to you, Pat, my final three. Um, how how can we deal with harbourage in old stone walls and ditches? Well, you see, um, we're talking about around buildings, around, you know, this is where you put out your, I mean, you don't, I mean, if it's old stone walls and ditches, they're they're away from where your house is. So or where your shed is or whatever. I mean, what what the crew talk about is that around the actual building, you shouldn't have your 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 hedges and your pallets and everything right up. So that if you have a clear area around the building, a rat or a mouse has to go through the open to get in. 
They may be out in the hedges, they may be out in the stone walls and further, but actually around each building, there should be a clear apron, a clear area that's not covered. So that there's no actual cover from a hedge or a stone wall into the building. It doesn't mean they can knock down every hedge and stone wall on your farm because there might be a rat in it. It's around the buildings, just the actual area around the buildings where this attention to detail must be paid. Okay. Effective ways to introduce or encourage barn, owl box, uh, barn owls. Obviously, we mentioned the boxes, but I suppose with the food, uh, encouraging them, they need places apart from living. So just any tips on that, Aina? Well, I mean, they're going to have to need food as well, obviously. So again, another reason for not poisoning everything in sight. I mean, there's plenty of, of mice and voles and, you know, shrews and things like this for the owls to feed on, in fact. And the more we don't poison them, I mean, they... they I don't want to put you all off your breakfast or your coffee or whatever you're having next. But the amount of, I mean, someone did hard sums with compound interest. And I think a pair of rats, a pair of mice or a pair of rats yeah. can produce, I think, about 100 offspring in a year. So like there's, there's going to be no shortage of food for the myth to not being poisoned by this sort of way. So I think. And, and I'm sure, Anna, you, you'd agree. You, cover, you plant trees, you have hedges, yeah. you have cover for these small creatures to live in. Then, you know, that will work. And Anna, can we can I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the we, we have a major push on grass margins now, rough grass margins, and ideal for the 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 shrews and the. Oh yeah, they're wonderful. I mean, that's why yes. you see all those kestrels on the sides of motorways yeah. because they're the rough grass ma- grass margins between the road and the fields or whatever. But the sides of motorways are rough grass margins, and they really are a magnet for small mammals like that. So by not yeah, yeah. right into the hedge, by leaving a little bit the hair's corner or whatever, you're, you're giving habitat for those small creatures Super. without necessarily they being down in the barn eating the grain on you. Like the same okay. And my last one about uh, we're encouraging cats and dogs. Are they a danger to other wildlife? Well, they are, of course. Yeah, yeah. You can't say to the cat. Now, you're only to catch mice, not catching <laughs> robins, not catching this sort of thing. You know, um. The, the birds, they do have a on birds and they do that in the morning early whereas the, the mice are out at night. So really you should manage your cat, not let it out at cat flap between dawn and eight o'clock because it's that those few hours after the dawn when the birds are up, particularly in, in May and June, that the, they do the depredation. So on the on the one hand and on the other hand, you know. But again, I think on farms possibly where, where hedges are in good condition and stuff, the birds, the natural, you know, maybe slightly different in a garden. But yeah, on a farm, it's if, if everything, the habitats are in good condition. The, the birds, town garden, you have a bird table. I mean, just yes. the cat even an eye. Whereas if it's, if it's fields and hedges and trees and, you know. It should be okay. Yeah. The trees leaping onto the birds, you know, so it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Pat. Okay, so there's an idea out there for somebody with, for a time-controlled cat flap. Here <laughs> 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 first. Well, listen, thank you very much. We are we're out of time. Really fascinating. I think a, 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 an important contribution to I, I, I think the protection of our uh, of our wildlife. Uh, I see there's a there's been quite a bit of of. Uh, media coverage of some, I suppose, gains in relation to barn owls and farmers uh, indicating that they they have got farm owls back on their farms, and and it's a an absolute point of pride with a lot of farmers now that that, that that's happened. Everybody loves the barn owls, really, indeed, yeah. So listen, thank you again for joining us. I think we probably have one of about 10 different topics that we could bring you on on and, and use your expertise again. So anytime that you're available, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. So thanks for, from, from everybody. My agent. <laughs> okay, no problem. Or something. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity on behalf of Brew. And I hope um, people who didn't maybe see it live and looking at the podcast later on. Thank you very much, Catherine, yeah. and thank you very much, Pat. And to remind everybody, it'll be up next week on, on podcast and on, on the web, uh, as are all of our previous uh, uh, episodes. Uh, just to, to finish off, to, uh, next week uh, we'll be joined uh, to discuss the, the Chagas Mac by uh, Dr. Gary Lanigan from Chagas. So I think it's it's one, it's a core part of our policy in relation to uh, uh, driving our, our climate ambitions in relation to agriculture. Uh, so I hope you have an opportunity to join us then. Until then, thanks to Yvonne and Andy, uh, and we'll see you next week.